Hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Alana Rabinovich, and I'm just delighted to welcome you to the very first of our monthly Scotiabank Giller Prize Master Panels. Tonight is especially meaningful because tonight we honor Black History Month with five enormously talented and accomplished individuals. They have credentials up the wazoo. The award-winning Cecil Foster, past Scotiabank Giller Prize juror, author, scholar, journalist, and essayist will be moderating tonight's conversation. On the panel, we have the multi-award winning writer, Zalika Reed Benta. Benta is also a mentee and program manager at Diaspora Dialogues. Benta is currently the jury chair for the 2021 Giller Prize. From Vancouver, award-winning writer, essayist, teacher, and CEO of her very own literary studio, Breathing Space Creative, Shailene Knight. Ch uh, Knight works as a literary agent at the Transatlantic Agency. She is one of just a handful of Black literary agents in Canada. Ronaldo Walcott, polymath, professor of Black diaspora cultural studies, as well as gender studies, writer, editor, and past Canadian research chair of social justice and cultural studies. And we have 2019 Scotiabank Villa Prize winner for his novel reproduction, Ian Williams. Williams has a doctorate in English from the University of Toronto, has taught poetry at the University of British Columbia, and is now teaching at U of T. Audience, please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We'll try and get to them all. So I'm as eager as all of you are to get to it. Without further ado, please welcome Cecil Foster and the rest of the group. Good evening and bon soirée à tous, especially our first nations fellow travelers. And thanks to the organizers of the Giller Master Panel for inviting us for its first Black History Panel discussion on issues on Black publishing. We have a wonderful panel this evening, writers and even a Black agent, and I'm happy to be a panelist and moderator. I also, in particular, want to thank you for joining us, and I invite you to later in the hour to join us with your questions. So what is the state of Black publishing in Canada at this point, Black History Month 2021, in the era of I Can't Breathe and Remember Their Names as Testaments of Social Justice and Recognition? To get a conversation going, I would like to give four short anecdotes that I hope will help to frame our discussion. And at the same time, I hope they will allow us, in particularly, in particular me, to honor three outstanding Canadian writers who laid so much of the foundation for Black literature today. Anecdote one. So one afternoon, I dropped by the house of Austin Clark, as I was wont to do in those days. There were tough times for me and Austin back then. That is another way of saying that, quite frankly, we were both broke. I found Austin sitting on the steps of his house, and after our usual greetings, he told me he was expecting a visit from a Meruf Sarsfi. I didn't know Meruf personally, but she was seeking to publish a manuscript, and she was having no success interesting publishing houses. She wanted to pick our brains. Mayor Ruth quickly showed up and was simply amazed that Austin and I considered as two of the so-called leading or established Black writers in Canada could not tell her with any surety how she could get her manuscript read, far less published. We could not even recommend an agent. Mayor Ruth eventually self-published the manuscript as no crystal staircase and to much success, so that eventually a major house republished the book. 
But that afternoon, the most she could get from Austin and me was a promise that Austin would read the manuscript, something that Austin did as encouragement to just about any black writer approaching him. But Mayor Ruth was not satisfied. Instead, was deeply disappointed. If Austin and I couldn't open doors for other black writers, then who could? She felt that Canadian mainstream publishing was disrespectful to black writing, and she did something about it. Utilizing her contacts in government and business, Mayor Roof organized a cross-country tour for the three griots, Mayor Roof herself, Austin, and me, and we toured Canada, speaking to very large events. Occasionally, there was a fourth griot, Dion Brand, who joined us in Ottawa and Toronto. Mayor Roof's message was that there was an audience for black writers and black literature if there was enough of an effort made. Mayor Roof and Austin are no longer with us, and I personally miss them badly. So I want to start by honoring Austin and Mayor Roof for making it easier to get published and to bring recognition for black writers in Canada. The second anecdote revolves around some drinks I was having one evening with Ayanna Black around the same time. I had gone to meet with my editor and publisher, Ed Carson, a most helpful man at HarperCollins, and Ayanna and I had agreed to have a drink after that meeting. Our concern after a few drinks was how could more black voices be heard and recognized in Canada? Still at the bar, we made a list of the leading Canadian writers, or who we thought were the leading writers, on the back of a white bar napkin. From this would come the pioneering anthology Voices, edited by Ayanna Black, published by HarperCollins. That book will give voice and voices to just about every Black writer of that time who went on to build a structure for Black literature, for Canadian literature. Among them at the risk of leaving out some names are Larry Hill, Dion Brand, Afua Cooper, Jan Carew, Andrea Alexis, George Elliott Clark, Makeda Silvera, Ayanna Black, and of course, Austin and myself. Ayanna too is no longer with us, but she left a significant contribution. I honor her too. The third anecdote comes from the second. There were no identifiable editors of color in any of the major publishing houses. There were no agents either. This made it difficult for black and minority writers to get published. And when they did to find an editor with the requisite sensibilities and sensitivities. The anthology voices helped to correct that. I had worked with a female editor of color on a previous book, a place called Heaven, the Meaning of Being Black in Canada. That editor would acquire voices and then its follow-up nonfiction anthology, Fairy Spirits. These were the first books she edited, might have even been the first books she acquired. That editor is none other than Mai Majavi, who became and still is one of this country's most successful editors. The final anecdote comes from the Giller Prize Award two years ago. Austin has set the high mark of becoming the first black Giller Prize winner. Then we had Essie Dujijin, Andrea Alexis, and then Essie again. That year, we would get another black winner. As I sat listening to the announcement of the winner, I felt a knock on my knee as my wife signaling me to sit up straight. For right there, as the name was announced, was a CBC TV cameraman capturing the look on my face. One of our panelists, Ian Williams, was leaving his mark on Canadian literature. My thought, even as the camera was on me, was, well, what would Mayor Ruth and Ayanna think tonight? Would they say that we as Black people can't say anymore that we aren't mainstream? We are winning Gillers, aren't we, and other prizes. So my question then 
And Ian, I will come to you. Is it true, as would be said in the Black and West Indian communities, could it be that Black writing and Black writers have gone clear? What are your thoughts? <laughs> well, good night, Cecil, and thanks for the anecdotes and the introduction. You know what, I think the association with going mainstream is that one has sold out, one has left uh, one's values, principles, decency, all of that behind and uh, agreed to participate in um, a system that you were formally excluded from, yeah, at a great cost to yourself, right? That there's a bit of selling out associated with mainstream. Um, what I like about your introduction there and the anecdotes is this sense that um, behind black success, there's always this horde of invisible labor. I know that's a trendy term and it's a little bit out of fashion right now. There's this horde of invisibility, the ghosts, the ancestors, all of these people that have made it possible for you, um, who oftentimes don't share that spotlight, but without them, there's no way you could have been there. Um, and those could be literary people, they could be people in your community and your life and all of that. Um, yeah, and so there's this tension I feel all the time between the mainstream, between being recognizable and knowing that you were invisible a few years ago or that invisibility was the thing you were destined to be um, uh, like many people who came before you. Um, and so to both celebrate the idea that you're uh, popular now and to mourn the fact of the other people who could have been right in your shoes, in your place, had we been born in a different time, and had you know the the sequence been a little bit different. Um, so I mean, gratitude, gratitude not for the agent that does the mainstreaming, but gratitude for the people who brought you to this this place that the world is ready to see you now. So, so Shirley, Shirley, um, you are what will have been in my beginning a rarity, a black mm -hmm. agent. Um, what are your thoughts? Um, is it different being a black agent? I, you know, I, I think it is. And I think it's a really nuanced position to be in, you know, starting out as a writer uh, myself and also working in editing and teaching creative writing. I feel like I have uh, my hands in various pots for various reasons. And I think deeply about that. What does it mean to be a writer and understand what a writer needs in order to get their work published? What kind of support does a writer need? What kind of transparency does a writer need? And so being an agent, I think, you know, I'm able to sort of look at all of those, those layers and really kind of peel them back. Uh, and I think that's a really privileged position to be in. Uh, I wanted to be an agent for a very long time, but in understanding the business models, the barriers, uh, the lack of transparency around the financial side of things, I knew that it was something that I had to enter into uh, very intentionally. I had to align a lot of my collaborators and my supports, right? So that idea of, of really recognizing the folks behind the scenes, like Ian said, I think is a really important part, really important part of that. But I think it's, it's different, but it's also there is that circle of support that I crave and that I demand, right? So, you know, having the support of my colleagues who are always at the ready with this tool, this resource, uh, this layer of support. I think we're in a time where we're finally being open about what it is we need in order to thrive in these positions. And I think for me, sustainability is key. You know, I can enter into these roles and I can stay for three months, four months, five months, but I want to be in these roles for a really long time. And so I think about uh, long term careers uh, in terms of how do we hold this position? How do we hold this equitable position? How do we create entry points for other folks to come into these roles as well? So I'm thinking deeply about that. So not only about how this experience is for me being a black agent today, but also how can I create uh, these windows, doors, entry points for other folks who then want to come into these roles and then hold on to them. 
do. And, uh, and Zalika, uh, a couple of years ago, I was somewhat in the same position of view of having to read almost 160 books um, for the Giller Prize. Um, but apart from that, do you have any concern about being a black juror and the perception that you might be looking for a black book, a black winner? Um, that's actually something that I haven't really thought about. Um, I think that when there's that perception of you're looking for a black winner or looking for a black book, there's this idea that um, the black, that black writing or black authors or any black artist isn't talented. Um, that there's this idea that they're less talented than their peers, but because they're black, um, I'm going to be looking for them. And I, and I think that's, and that's just something that I don't like to think about because that is a detriment to the writer and to myself. So I think that it's perfectly acceptable to just be looking for a book and looking for, um, looking for great art and great literature. And if the person is black, then the person is black. Um, I, I, so it's just not something that ever really entered my mind, to be honest, um, because the talent will show itself. Uh, if that is the perception that other people will have, if I happen to really like a book by a black author and I'm fighting for that author, then I, I actually don't think that's my problem. That's their problem because that's their narrow-minded view. And I don't think I should have to be concerned with that. I think that's something that they have to think about. Why is that the first thing that came to your mind if I'm advocating for this book? Why can't you just believe that it's a talented book? So I think that's something that they have to work on themselves. And indeed, um, isn't there a likelihood that if you were to internalize that kind of thinking that I referenced, that you might end up being, in fact, being harsher on I, black writers I, than, than, than you ought to be. I think that's a possibility. I think, um, I mean, I think that is a, a conversation in, in different artistic communities of different artistic black communities of whether or not you're harsher on um, you're on harsher on black writers, or harsher on black filmmakers, because they're not doing everything. They're not representing everything that you think that they should. And if it was a white writer, you wouldn't have that same sort of responsibility. So that's definitely um, that's definitely a possibility. I think just in general, because that's a conversation that happens quite often um, in every art form. I find. And Ronaldo, we, we we tend to talk about literature as this amorphous thing and blackness again of this amorphous thing out there and when we put the two together we get something that is very amorphous to say the least. Um, what are you thinking these days about what constitutes black literature and black literature in Canada and if there might be emphasis that are misplaced or not placed in the right places? Um, first let me begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to participate in this panel um with um these really lovely colleagues um so, so that's a really difficult question to begin with um so let me let me hazard to say that you know my my thinking about what might constitute black literature black letters um black art is really about what the producer the writer the artist is doing to um, not just center the lives of Black people, but account for the ways in which Black people live and make lives. And, and that, for me, um, is more important than thinking about um, explaining or translating Black people and their lives and the way they live their lives and the kind of art that you're making to another imagined audience. So I was like really curious about your question to Ian around this kind of question of, of entering a mainstream. Uh, because I would say that, you know, folks are not actually entering the mainstream, that what constitutes itself as the mainstream is finally having an encounter that it should have had a long time. And that's an entirely different way of thinking about different communities and different populations. 
And it means then that that encounter means that they're gonna have to learn something new. They're gonna have to learn to read differently. They're gonna have to learn to recognize other experiences as legitimate. They're going to have to engage other ways of seeing the world as also authoritative. So for me then, all of that is encapsulated in what I think is the best black literature, that it makes no excuses from about the place that it speaks from and who it speaks to, but it is really conscious of what it means to be black in the world, um, a world that in so many places and instances is launched against a, a black being, it's launched against black selves. I mean, and, and, and that's an interesting point. And I can remember um, conversations I would have had with Austin and when we would talk about whether publishing houses and agents and editors were sensitive enough to what we were talking about and how much water we need to pour into our wine to actually get a contract, to actually get published. Because at the end of the day, if you're a writer, you want to be published. And I often think of someone like um, Makeda Silvera, who was very insistent on being authentic, who wanted to be published in Jamaican Patwa and work that into her writing. And, and, and I thought she is an excellent writer, one of the better writers that we have around. But somehow, she always seemed to have overcome uh, or had to run in to face those kinds of barriers. Primarily from the notion that that writers were writing primarily for a black audience and white people were not buying our books. And as a result, we weren't um, selling enough books. And then along came someone like a Larry Hill that, that um, blew that idea apart. So I'm wondering if there's anyone, I don't want to call anyone in particular, who would want to pick up on any of those observations that I made uh, in terms of the reality that I spoke about. Is that still the case for Canada, a multicultural Canada in 2021? Shalina, I see you're shaking your head. I'll, I'll, I'll let you go. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting to begin to have these conversations, right? When I think about having a Black writer and having a Black editor and what that conversation about this book will sound like, hear like, you know, what would that, what would that smell like? Like, what would that scenario really be like, right? And I think about, you know, I've had conversations with authors who've, you know, shared and confided in me and said, you know, I, I had this experience where, uh, you know, my white editor didn't understand what I was trying to say, and they wanted to change so much of the core of my book. Right, and not to say that these types of editorial relationships are not important because they are and they have, you know, they have value. But what would it be like to sit down with, you know, another black editor and be able to really, you know, get like really distill that manuscript down to its fossil resin? What would that feel like uh, to hold that space? And these are the conversations I'm having now with other writers, you know, to have a black agent even look at your manuscript and ask you a certain level of questions or, or kind of steer you in this, this particular direction in order to really highlight, you know, the, the beauty of, of the manuscript. So I think it's, it's an interesting conversation. And I think I, I think about informal mentorship even when we go this route, right? And I know Zalika, we've had a couple of conversations ourselves about mentorship and what that looks like and what the power of that informal mentorship uh, can be like. So uh, I think, you know, we're, we're entering into a time where we want to see a lot of these changes, right? We wanna see a lot of these um, conversations uh, taking place. So Ian, as um, someone who might be considered to be, if you were a musician, you would be a successful crossover artist. Um, <laughs> and uh, do you have any thoughts on what I have just said and Charlene have said? Uh, what, what I explain, is that in any way the experience that you have? Mm. I think what's uh, what maybe I can offer here is that I come out of um, a poetry background, right? So I come out of a, a field of literature where the stakes have been small <laughs> and the readership has been tiny. And so my priority has not been um, getting published, right? And I think it, to sort of rethink the problem would be like, what if we could write freely without market forces governing the things that we write and want to say? 
Um, and the market forces are linked to whiteness for sure institutionally. Um, but there's a kind of, if one didn't have to consider the market and if one didn't have to grapple with this question of audience, which is really a question of who am I trying to please in this, right? Who am I trying to please? And then the world sorts itself according to, you know, your various schema and categories. Um, if we could dispense with that, because we understood that each person had the capacity to relate and to understand our story, um, then I think there would be a kind of renaissance, right? Like not, not a renaissance of blackness, but like a real renaissance of, uh, of, of art um, happening. So I, I think the freedom issue is a, it's a lot bigger than, um, hmm. it, it's not simply about, it's not simply about uh, black agents and editors and black publishers. These are hard things to say, Cecil, so, so pardon me. It's also about developing the skills I think that Ronaldo's trying to get at or, or successfully got at about an audience that can handle the things that you wanna to say to sort of build the capacity within people and individuals to be able to process a black story, not as an anomaly, but that we all have this big sort of empathetic range to do it. Yeah. But as you know, um, none other than a Toni Morrison says that, especially when you're thinking of black literature, that it should never be easy to read. Mm -hmm. that it should require effort. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that might be giving us a double burden as writers and, and uh, as artists and as people may be writing with a social conscience. Um, so I, I hear you in saying, um, if we can assume away that the market weren't there, but in fact, that is usually the first thing we run head into the market. Yeah. And, uh, and especially in this day and age where they seem to be dwindling publishing houses and how decisions are made, and uh, Ronaldo, let me come back to you. Um, could you expand on your thought? Because I would like to encourage you to reflect on what you were saying and what Ian and Shalene have said, if we talk about situating writing in a multicultural setting. Yeah, thanks Cecil. Look, I think there are a couple of things um, and you would know this really well. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a couple of examples that you know really well. You know that when Austin Clark won the Gala for the Polish Hole, there was also some conversation about whether or not the Polish Hole can be constituted as a Canadian novel. And of course, Austin had some responses to that. Everything from the fact that he wrote it in Canada to the place that Canada is situated in the history of transatlantic slavery and on and on. Or we could take a, a novel like your novel, Slam and Tar, uh, one of the earliest novels in this country to look at the farm workers, the foreign workers program, in particular looking at the lives of black men um, on farms and the ways in which that novel got read as being about the Caribbean and not being about Canada. Or you invoke Makeda Silvera, you know, her novel, The Heart Does Not Bend, it's a novel that unapologetically uh, partially portrays the lives of two black lesbians in love. And part of the reason why I want to point to those three works is because what those three works set up is a different requirement for reading blackness and black life in Canada. And what those three works do is that they demonstrate that what is assumed as the reading community within the Canadian landscape doesn't have a language or claims to not have a language for reading black life when black life is, is produced outside of the constraints of pathologization. And so for me, one of the things that I think someone like Shalene uh, Shaleen has to deal with is as, as an agent selling work is, who is she selling work to? And we know that in terms of the main, mainstream publishing in this country, you're largely selling work to white men and white women. White men and white women who largely do not have 
uh, any really profound understanding of black life in this country and one may argue even black life beyond this country. So the task then of writing work that situates black life in the Canadian context um, and work that refuses to dwell in, in a kind of literature of pathology uh, poses a significant problem for how, um, and I'm gonna use this with quotation marks, mainstream publishers understand what is black Canadian literature at any particular time and place. Now that doesn't mean that people doing and writing black Canadian literature don't come through those venues and come through those spaces, but it means that it takes, it takes some work to get a particular element of part of that industry to understand what exactly is at stake. Let's remember that, you know, after the Polish whole, Austin published two collections of poetry and he went back to the small press, um, right? They weren't published by the big press. So there's also a history of black writers in this country coming through small presses, emerging into the larger mainstream press and returning to small press as well. And that tells you something about what Ben Shalin said, talked about this question of sustainability. It tells you something about, you know, that there are the logic of sustaining Black literature as a part of the Canadian literary landscape is ongoing difficult work. It's not, it's not something that's settled at all, regardless of who is winning prizes when, at what point in time. Yes, and indeed, um, you and I um, are perhaps to the people in Canada who will be familiar with the fact that even the questioning of Austin's um, winning um, had a longer history and Austin would have shared it with us of what happened when he, in fact, he went to his grave thinking that he should have won the governor general's award earlier for the prime minister. And that he was in fact um, removed from consideration after the short list was drawn up because he was a Barbadian, he was black. So there is that issue that has been there for a long time. And I would like to, bring Zalika in and, and to ask her if she is an optimistic person or a pessimistic person or how she feels. Um, is it that black literature is becoming easier to read? Is it that we are hitting the, the chords and the notes that others can hear resonating? Is there some kind of reconciliation that is going on? That's an interesting question. Um, just because listening to these different conversations, and um, I'm I'm doing it from a writer's perspective, and obviously those different conversations that Shaleen and Ian and Ronaldo are talking about are in the back of my mind. But that's not something that I want to bring to my work when I'm actually writing it, because then I think I freeze. So what I'm writing about, like when I was writing Frank Planton, I knew automatically that I was just going to talk about black girls. Black Jamaican girls, Black Caribbean girls in Toronto, and everyone else was going to have to deal with it. Um, and I don't think that I would have been able to, I mean, there's definitely different um, people before me, like we're talking about Matea Silvera, who has done something like that. Um, and so, and so just being able to have that history definitely helped with that, but I just knew that I had I started writing Frank Planton when I was in school and I was reading all these different books by all these different white writers who just wrote about their lives and didn't really think about how that would translate to other people. And so I was like, if they're doing that, then I can do that. And, um, and it was difficult when I had to workshop it, of course, because readers weren't used to that and they were trying to make it a um, memoir and they were trying to make it autobiographical and they were trying to say why don't you just change the character's name to your name and I was like because it's not me I can write about other black characters without it being myself and um, I do put Jamaican Patwa in it and that was definitely something that was contentious and um, I, I, did wa I did end up watering it down more than I probably would have liked to while also remaining retaining an aspect of it that I thought was acceptable enough. Um, and, and then getting it published was a whole other ordeal. But when I did get it published, 
and I did get responses to it, the responses I was looking for were whether or not people could see themselves. And so when I have people come to me through email or through Instagram or through Twitter saying, yeah, that was my street and I know, and this was what my grandmother was like, and yeah, definitely like Oxdale all the time. I'm like this, then I did what I wanted to do. The fact that other people from not of a Caribbean or black context can look at it and be like, oh yeah, like I remember my first snow day is amazing, but that wasn't really what I was thinking about while I wrote it. And I think from just the different books that I've read, whether it's Shut Up Your Pretty, um, by Tama Tunji, or whether it's something like Queenie um, that's in the UK, I think that there is this sort of, not that there wasn't a sense of being unapologetic before, because there was, and if there wasn't before, then we couldn't do that now, but there is this sense of everyone's just going to have to deal with the way that we write, and um, so from an artistic perspective, I think that I like seeing more stories like that out there. And I think that people are responding to that more just because there is this idea. And it's true that a lot of readers are white, but a lot of readers are also non-white and a lot. And I think with social media and things like Twitter and Instagram, people are being, are able to share that more. They're able to show their reading more. And so I think for me, I'm optimistic in the sense that um, there's a more, that people are sharing what they're reading and sharing their perspectives of what they're reading more. There's things like bookstagram on Instagram and things like books on TikTok. And so um, having other people being able to, to share in that is something that I think that um, is celebratory because the idea of who a reader is is changing because we're all seeing different and diverse readers. I am not sure if I answered your question, Cecil, but that's uh, kind well, of what I well, was well, it's, thinking. It certainly is one of those questions that I'm not sure that we can ever answer, ever exhaust. And, and, and this is where I'd like to go back um, to Shaleen, and, uh, because um, I would like to turn the lenses, and uh, Shaleen as a, an agent and an editor, um, and, and, and still sticking with the notion as to whether as Zalika said, everything we do is, bi is biographical in some way, and if we can ever set that aside. What do you encounter when you, as a Black agent, walk into pre-COVID, an editorial board, or you go to Frankfurt, or you go wherever, and you have to make a pitch as an agent, whether you be selling mm -hmm. Black, First Nation, white or, or other books. What is it like for you as an agent that is black? Mm -hmm. It's interesting for me as a newer agent, as an associate agent, as someone who is also still learning the ropes and asking a lot of questions. I think for me, when I, when I enter into a space, I think about the conversations that are not being had. I think about the questions that are not being answered. And I think about the way we acquire work. What does that really look like? Uh, for me, I'm, I'm open to working with writers, especially Black writers, who may not have their manuscripts at a super polished level, whatever that might mean. So for me, I might be pitching the idea behind a book. I might be pitching the author. I might be pitching the potential to help this author grow into you know, having this, this super polished manuscript. So I think the way in which we acquire material needs to shift and we need to start asking questions um, around you know how how do we how did we traditionally do this how do we traditionally buy books sell books what does that look like so I find that as a newer agent I'm asking a lot of questions I'm definitely asking a lot more than I am speaking to which I think is really important so we're often put into as a black agent or as a black publishing professional I find that we're you know we're often put into these positions um, as experts or were asked to lead uh, certain conversations when I think there's a moment in time that we just wanna step back and listen and we wanna learn as well. And I think it was uh, my colleague, uh, Leonika Valsius, who I think is here in the, um, the, the event, we had a conversation around this and we were talking about what it means to sit at a table 
whether that's a table in a position of power or that's you know a table around someone's kitchen what does it look like to have these conversations with each other and just listen and learn from each other uh, instead of being put in positions where we then have to be an expert in that moment. So when I enter these rooms, I'm thinking uh, deeply about that and, and how I can learn so that that knowledge that I then um, extract, um, I can take that and put that back out into the community. So I think about communication, I think about transparency, and I think about these conversations uh, and you know, being a black agent in these, in these rooms, in these spaces, I want to be able to do that work. So that's something that I think about in terms of being in these editorial spaces and discussing uh, authors and potential manuscripts. What does it look like if we sort of move the lens over and we focus on uh, the sides of a manuscript that we're not really talking about. And there's potential to do so much with that. Yes, and uh, we're beginning to get um, some questions that are coming in. So mm -hmm. please submit your questions. And uh, before I go fully and transition to the questions, um, I want to give Ian a chance to comment on anything that he's heard, anything that is resonating with him or anything that he might disagree with. And, I'm just, uh, Cecil, yeah, I mean, I'm just smiling hearing, you know, four different minds think, right? I think there's a sense of kind of isolation um, when we're constantly in dialogue with whiteness rather than with each other. And I just think it's beautiful uh, to see, to hear what Shaleen has to say. What you said about listening is really important. Um, one doesn't always have to have something to say or to add, right? I think the listening is the is a contribution. So really happy to be here. Looking forward to the questions. Yes, and the first question um, comes to Zalika. And uh, you're quoted as having said, the talent will show itself. Shouldn't it have to show itself over the ages rather than in one book? That's the challenge that's thrown out to you. The challenge, um, sorry, could you repeat the, could you repeat the question? That you said that um, ultimately it's the talent that will show itself. And the questioner is asking, should it have to show itself over the ages? And I guess the implication is, at what point do you give up on the talent or you, you, you indicate that the, the, the talent has been revealed? Um. I'm not sure about the point where you give up on the talent, but to be clear when I said that the talent will show itself because the question was whether or not um, I'm worried about the perception that when I'm reading books, I'm looking for the black writer um, instead of looking for the talent. And I, what I meant when I said the talent should show itself is that when I'm going to be, if I were to ever do these arguments and these debates, then what I'm speaking to are the attributes of the book. I'm speaking to the talent of the book and the talent of the writer. I'm not speaking to the, I'm not speaking to the fact that the writer is black in the way that people would expect it to. If I'm talking about the content and the content is about black characters and black lives, then obviously I'm speaking to blackness, but I'm speaking to the way that this particular writer would, um, would portray it. So if talent should show itself over the years, I'm sure talent has shown itself over the years, but there isn't someone in the room who's able to advocate for that talent. And the fact that if I'm in the room and I'm able to advocate for that talent, then that's what I'm doing. Um, instead of it just being like, oh yeah, you just want this person because this person is black. Um, so, so that's kind of what I, what I was speaking to. Well, in fact, um, the questioner went on to comment that it is great to see events like this, but that maybe um, it is sad that we can only have a panelist of five people like us during Black History Month, and that success might very well reveal itself when there's no need for even panel discussions like these. Anyone want to respond to those sentiments? Go ahead, Ronaldo. You know, every time we do these kinds of events, there's someone who has that fantasy 
<laughs> the fantasy that four or five black people should not be able to sit down and have a conversation together and the fantasy that if this conversation didn't happen or it never happened again that we would have somehow achieved um, something important the funny thing is that that fantasy never works the other way so that when five or six white people get together to discuss something there's never the fantasy that that should be broken up that that shouldn't happen but apart from that i think that you know there's an underlying premise to to those kinds of questions that that really reveal that um, the person who is asking is really not thinking deeply and thoughtfully about the social and cultural arrangements through which we live our lives and experience the world. And so, you know, so casting some light on what it means to think about Black arts and letters in the Canadian context, it's not four or five Black people getting together into a separatist party. It's about four or five Black people offering a diagnosis and an assessment of what it means to live a Black life in this place called Canada. And it's really kind of disappointing to, to see those kinds of questions because it, be, it betrays something about why exactly the conversation is needed in the first instance. Well, in fairness, Ronaldo, I might have relayed the question badly to you because I think that the questioner would agree with what you're saying and that what the questioner was really asking is why there isn't more of these things happening regularly and why is it that it is exceptional when this happens? So uh, I will take that one. I probably asked the question badly and the uh, okay. person might be more in line with you. So let me go on to another question and it is, um, the writer is originally from Detroit and have enjoyed many US and international black writers. And he's asking, but is there a special Canadian black perspective? Ian? Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, not yeah, there is. I mean, yeah, there's this idea that um, blackness behaves uniformly across the entire globe, right? And um, I think it's important to realize that there's diversity within a group, within the group of blackness, that to be a black Caribbean person is uh, feels different in the body from being black in Canada or America or Britain or Africa. Or where have you? So to um, respect sort of diasporic underpinnings for our existence, um, I couldn't tell you exactly what uh, that Black Canadian writing or literature is supposed to look like because it's again very different to grow up in Brampton versus Vancouver versus all over the place. Um, so it's it's hard to homogenize. I know the question is we want a kind of handle on something rather than a box on it. Um, but I think this is one of those cases where we have to deal with the messiness and the complexity of it, rather than reducing us to this is what the Canadian voice sounds like. Yeah, it's wonderfully varied and diverse. That's that's how I'd respond to it. But I'm wondering, um, Zalika, if you are hearing in that question the same roots for the kind of authenticity that you were talking about earlier. If you see something about it that comes out of the Canadian environment being situated in a Brampton or a Toronto that is unique? Um, I think, at least from my experience, because I also did write part of this while I was in the States, um, which was very interesting because a lot of uh, my stories didn't take place in winter. So everyone was like, where's the snow? How is this Canadian if there isn't the snow? And I was like, it's Canadian because I'm Canadian and this is taking place in Toronto, which is in Canada. Um, and I ultimately did write um, a story that was during winter. But anyway, I think it's more about um, certain specificities like slang um, and, and the way that we say certain things. Like um, I remember just having different American friends and they're just being like, wait, you guys say, like, you say skin out? What's skin out? I don't know what that means. And I was just like, okay, well, in a Caribbean context, that means what you guys would say is like, turn up. And that's a little bit more specific. And I think having those different, even though it seems a little superficial because it's like, it's coming from a different context because it's a specifically Caribbean context. It's a, And then it's 
for me specifically, it's a Jamaican context. And so in the household, it's Jamaican. And so it's a Jamaican Canadian experience. And so that offers a unique sort of aspect to it as opposed to something that takes place in Texas, for instance. Um, I will also say that the merging of food is something that when African-Americans have read my book, they were just kind of like, oh, so like poutine, what's poutine? That's kind of different. I, I've never really known what that is. Is that the same thing as cheese fries? And But having that in the same story where jerk chicken and curry chicken is also um, there, that basically the sense of conflation between cultures is something that um, I have found to be not specific to Canada, but a specific experience for in, in a Canadian context because it's dealing with Canadian things as opposed to things that you would find in the States. And so I think just the fact that it's opening a different sort of perspective and a different environment to other people, that's what makes it unique. While at the same time, um, I do know that there, there is some crossover between things like um, because the society still views you or the character as black. And because society views you as just this homogenous black person, there's going to be some overlap between experiences. So it's just sort of like this back and forth that, that I find. Thank you. And we have a very interesting question from a Jake Thompson. And uh, Jake, are you there? Can you ask the question? Well, apparently, um, Jake can't answer the question, so I'll speak for Jake. And, uh, and perhaps, Shalene, you might be best placed to answer this. And the question is that he would like to know about the disparity between the advances given to white writers and black writers. Oh, what a big question I have to <laughs> answer. Uh, I think it's a little bit more nuanced and layered than just that idea of a white writer advance and a black writer advance. And again, uh, being someone who is still learning and still listening and still paying close attention to all of the conversations and the hashtags and, and everything that's out there. Uh, I think, again, it comes right down to transparency. What happens behind these closed doors where these books are discussed? Um, what kinds of conversations are happening? Uh, what are we saying about these books? What are we saying about the audience? Uh, about the intended community, uh, of course, and where we see this book going, right? So it's kind of like what Zalika said around these communities and these experiences being so nuanced and so different and so, you know, inside of each other and layered and overlapping, right? So, so those conversations around where we see these books going that I think kind of ties itself to things like advances. But of course, you know, there's always the practical things to think about in terms of, is this a debut author? Does this author have a track record? What were their sales like? And all these different conversations that are on the table. But again, you know, my goal as an agent, as someone who has their hand on the doorknob and is almost inside of that room, I think a lot about the information that I carry uh, in working with a lot of these authors. What information or intel could I then take from the author uh, and present to the big decision makers in terms of which books are going to be, you know, attached to these these bigger advances, right? So there's a lot of layers and a lot of conversations that I think um, uh, we are not always privy to. Uh, and I think, again, that idea of transparency is huge um, from the level of creating these manuscripts to trying to get them published. There's so much that happens behind closed doors. Uh, and I would personally love to see a lot more of that start to come to light. And we need to have more conversations around how a lot of this works so that we can sort of, you know, unpack a lot of these, these hashtags that we're then faced, faced with. And yes, um, there's another question that um, where someone wants, uh, an expansion of what Ronaldo said, and that was the very important point raised that black writers often have to go through the big, the small, the big, the small presses, and they never seem to be able to arrive. So the question is, is this an experience really being 
in a secure position of authority? And how does that kind of uncertainty affect literature in general? Uh, that's a great question. I, I mean, I, I think Cecil, you, you could speak to this too from your own experience. Um, I'm just going to speak to this from my from my own observations. Um, but it, it seems to me that at least in the in the realm of literary fiction, that what I've observed is that so much depends on the relationship the black writer holds with the editor at a given press and the work that the literary agent is able to do to secure ongoing contracts in relationship to publishing with the large mainstream multi, multi multinational press um and so what that means is that if there's any falter between you and your literary agent or you and your editor so if your editor leaves your work can dry up and you have to find someplace else. And that means, usually means that the black writer is returning to, to the small press. And of course, in Canada, the small independent press for someone like me who only does nonfiction has been absolutely crucial and important because for instance, the mainstream literary, the mainstream multinationals can't seem to imagine um, black critics outside of a logic of memoir. So that's something that we might not get to talk about, but that's a dangerous trend for black eyed days. Um, so the question of what constitutes authority of what constitutes, I think you use the language Cecil of crossover is for black writers in Canada, a really slippery and, and a really slippery one. And anyone who has studied um, the length of this and how it works, um, winning major prices in this country for the black writer actually does not mean that you are secured in terms of ongoing contracts at major press at major houses in this country so so that's some that's something that we have to sit with and think about that we should not very quickly arrive at some notion that there has been an arrival and that is complete that it's sewn up and, and it's a parcel and it's ready to be mailed because that's not the case at all, I would argue. Well, I, we, we're drawing close to the end uh, and I want to say, Ronaldo, that you're so correct, even in my own case. And a quick example of my latest book, um, they call me George, uh, which is doing extremely well, um, was with a small house and there had the edge to want to publish something like this. But there are a couple of questions which I wish we had some more time for, like, for example, people wanted to know about how you get an agent. Is it easy to get an agent? And uh, someone who is doing an MFA, what kind of tips there you can, can be given to them? Uh, again, maybe Zalika or Shaleen or Ian, any sort of closing thoughts? Yes, Ian. Oh, sorry, that was me pointing at Shailene on my screen here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to defer on that question. That's, someone else has more expertise on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm scrolling through the questions now, and I see one um, about polished work. The issue of polished work is definitely one of privilege, I think. I am annoyed by academia because of this. Can you comment further on this? This is an interesting one for me. Um, I chose to kind of create... Uh, this patchwork kind of education, right? So I thrive in different environments, so I don't necessarily uh, like to situate myself in, in academic situations. That's not how I work. Uh, so I think, you know, again, it's that idea of opening up possibilities and creating new entry points and different pathways for folks to come into publishing. Uh, I didn't come into publishing from a publishing school. I also didn't come into um, writing my books and I didn't start with, you know, the big traditional, the big guns, the big publishers. Um, both of my books are out with, with a small press. So, I mean, there's, I, again, it's that idea of transparency. I keep saying that, but it comes uh -huh. back to sharing information uh, and, and making sure that we're, we're creating new spaces for folks. And, and Charlene and my fellow panelists, we are all out of time. It went by oh. all so quickly. There's so many more questions I would like to share and many more things I would like to tease out of you. And uh, 
maybe we should encourage Giller to have us back before the next Black History Month or some similar group. And we're saying that I want to say a very special thanks to everyone for participating, to the people who posed the questions. And uh, I want to take a sort of turn on what is often said at um, the Giller is to go out and buy some black books. <laughs> Well, wow. uh, I have a lot of adjectives and superlatives swirling around in my head. It's mayhem, but I, I, I just have to say that uh, that uh, uh, I actually have a question. You don't have to answer it, but but it's something that it's especially as a result of this conversation. It it feels like black writers have an unfair burden on themselves. You have to answer all these questions. You have to decide whether or not you want to be part of the mainstream. Other people might see that as selling out. I don't know. But it just, it's, I don't think it's something that white writers wrestle with. Does that make sense? For me, it makes a lot of sense. And my answer is straight up is yes to everything you've said. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for indulging me. I, I do uh, just want to say that it was an instructive and wholly absorbing hour. Thank you again for agreeing to be part of our first master panel. I think we would be glad to have you all back. Uh, and I want to let the audience know that tonight's panel will be available for viewing on our YouTube channel and on our website. We also have a full slate of book clubs that you might want to check out at Scotiabank Fuller Prize as well for the next six months. Uh, so again, uh, hard to thank you enough for lending us your, your time and your expertise and your lived experience. But I do thank you. <laughs>